Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. My name is Nargis Kasenova, and I'm director of the program on Central Asia at the Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies. Uh, thank you for joining us today. All of us following developments in the region have been hearing a lot about the Middle Corridor or Trans-Caspian um, International Transport Route. While the initiative is not new and precedes Russia's war against Ukraine, the war and ongoing geopolitical and geoeconomic shifts gave it a new momentum. It is a route bypassing Russia and, and an alternative to the so-called Northern Corridor. While the promise of more autonomy and better connectivity is there, the development of the corridor is not an easy feat. It will require major investment and unprecedented coordination by literal states. And the situation is complicated by the fact that it's not just transport logistics that we all collectively need to work on, but also the fragile ecosystem of the Caspian Sea. Today, we will discuss these challenges and strategies by which they could be collectively addressed. And we have an excellent panel with us today. And uh, let me introduce the speakers in the order I will ask them to uh, give their remarks. Uh, we'll start with uh, Dr. Nathan Hudson, who is an assistant professor of urban planning at the University of North Texas and consultant for the World Bank. He has 15 years of rail and maritime planning experience. His recent research relates to the impact of the invasion of Ukraine on the Belt and Road Initiative in Central Asia. Thank you for joining us, Nathan, and for co-organizing this event with me. Um, then we'll go to Jahan Taganova, um, who is a water diplomat and scholar working at the intersection of global development and public policy. Her research interests include water governance, integrated water resources management, climate justice, critical development studies, and social justice. Welcome, Jahan. Then we will go to Dr. Aga Bayrama, who is an assistant professor at the Department of International Relations at the University of Groningen. He has spent extensive time conducting field research in the Caspian Sea region. He has been working on the issues of environmental governance, energy security, geopolitics of the Caspian Sea region. And he is also a co-organizer of the podcast, A Global Perspective on European Politics. It's great to have you with us, Aga. Last Thanks. but not least, uh, we are honored to have with us Ambassador Ellen Mustard, um, who kept 38 years of diplomatic service as US Ambassador to Turkmenistan from January 2015 to June 2019. He's a fluent Russian speaker. Um, he spent roughly a third of his career as an American diplomat, either in the former Soviet Union or in Washington, dealing with that region. Currently, he's also a co-manager of an energy startup, Trans-Caspian U.S. Resources. Very warm welcome to you, Ambassador Master. So without further ado, uh, let me go to you, Nathan. The floor is yours. Thank you. And let me share my... Okay. Thank you very much, Nargis, for this opportunity. Are you seeing my screen correctly? The first slide? Yes? Okay. So um, thank you very much. I'd like to talk to you today about uh, Trans-Caspian governance and uh, an effort that Jahan and I are working to look at the trade um, and the environmental elements of the Caspian uh, concurrently. So to begin with, um, when we've talked about Trans-Caspian trade coordination, there are are a number of key challenges that require a lot of coordination, specifically with regards to aligning the logistics systems of both sides of the Caspian, digitalization of the processes, streamlining customs, and also having transparent access to tariffs and cargo tracking and understanding with a clear explanation the reasons why rates exist the way they do. And this will require a lot uh, of communication from both sides of the Caspian. Another major challenge in developing the Middle Corridor is balancing investment in containerized uh, trade, which is a growing component and is what's mainly talked about in the media, but then also the need for additional bulk capacity and bulk cargo. And also the different ports of the Caspian need to have a degree of specialization 
uh, with respect to their investments in containerized versus bulk capacity um, so that they are fulfilling that niche as efficiently as possible. And also the vessel fleet of the Caspian would need to be renewed and expanded and have more purpose-built vessels that would be specialized to handle the emerging um, Eurasian uh, commerce. We've all probably seen um, images of the uh, middle corridor and there are different iterations of it. And I want to point out that when we talk about the middle corridor, we shouldn't only talk about the connection in Kazakhstan. We should also look at the connection from Turkmenistan and the port of Turkmenbashi across to Baku. And we should also focus on the fact that the middle corridor could be very important uh, for the reconstruction of Ukraine. You can see the connections uh, to the different Ukrainian ports of Odessa and Mariupol, and also for now the reconstruction in Turkey as well through the BTK line, the rail line, uh, particularly after uh, the, the earthquake. So it has a lot of key uh, benefits for reconstruction. So obviously the middle corridor is what's been being discussed because of the disruption of the northern corridor uh, due to the war, but we can't say that the northern corridor is uh, fully uh, um, going away because it, as we see, there has been a decline. There's been a consistent decline in trains crossing uh, the Northern Corridor. For example, trains crossing the Bol uh, Poland-Belarusian border uh, in 2022 have been consistently declining. Um, but there is still a lot of train traffic that is occurring. Uh, and so it hasn't been growing the, the way that it was prior to the war, but it is still a component of the overall Eurasian trade. What its future is, is, is currently uncertain, but there is current, currently a key uh, opportunity for the middle corridor to grow and to make up for a significant component of this lost uh, corridor volume. So if we look at what, why the Northern Corridor was initially the corridor that was the corridor of conventional wisdom prior to the war, the, the supposed pros, which were clear, is that it was simpler logistically, right? You had- um, Nathan, Nathan so, sorry, I think we are not seeing your slide. We see the okay. second slide only. Uh, okay, uh, you're seeing Alignment. which, you're seeing, uh, okay. Alignment of logistics, we, we see the- So, okay, let me- Stop share and let me share the. Are you seeing the slide now? Yes. Okay. So, uh, if we see the again, I was pointing to the the northern the middle corridor at uh, the port of Turkmenbashi, connecting across to Baku, uh, connecting onto Odessa, and then looking at this uh, this chart showing the. Uh, de decrease in train volume coming across the po Poland-Belarusian border. And so we see continuing uh, reduction in train volumes uh, going across the uh, Poland-Belarus border. So uh, the pros and cons of the Northern Corridor, as it was assumed prior to the war in Ukraine, the Northern route through Kazakhstan is clearly simpler logistically. Um, it also has superior rail quality and a direct connection to Northern Europe. However, um, there was an assumption prior to the war that uh, Russia and China's close partnership would prevent, um, would prevent Russia from doing anything to disrupt that relationship. And so that was a reliance on basically Russia that would be transactional yet rational. But there were already existing uh, cons to that Northern corridor in that for one, it didn't really present a lot of development opportunities for Central Asia. It was really only targeted at Kazakhstan, which is already the, the country in, that had the strongest uh, development already in terms of GDP per capita. And also Kazakhstan's uh, market position was potentially compromised because it could also be bypassed due to Trans-Siberian uh, railway options, which redu reduced its market position. So basically it gave uh, Belarus, the maximum market power of the Northern Corridor. If we look at um, the, the ports that are primarily responsible for handling this traffic at the Middle Corridor, there are three main ports that are most critical. So a lot, 
Azerbaijan, which is just south of Baku, uh, is a new uh, constructed port as a support of Turkmen Bashi on the Turkmen side. Um, so these are both modern ports, but relatively modest. An older uh, port, but still with significant capacity, is in Aktal, Kazakhstan. So these are the three that are kind of the main linchpin of the middle corridor. Uh, but they are restricted in terms of their total capacity. They're all modest sized ports. And another major operational constraint for the Trans Caspian commerce um, is the fact that operations on the Caspian do tend to be impacted by weather uh, for a certain number of days uh, per year. So, what has been happening with the Middle Corridor since uh, the war? If we look at uh, what's happening since the invasion, uh, we do see a, a growth in uh, cargo volume. This is tracking the number of vessel arrivals. Um, at a lot of Azerbaijan from Aktau, which is one of the two main ports serving uh, Azerbaijan. But as you can see, these are relatively modest sized uh, vessels. They're about 7,000 deadweight tons and about 3.7 meters of draft. And so again, they don't have a tremendous amount of capacity as, uh, as is currently uh, aligned. So the question is, what is the middle corridor's niche? What will the middle corridor's niche be after uh, after Ukraine. So one point that I think we can all agree on is that the middle corridor cannot be a full substitute for the northern corridor. Uh, the capacity constraints, even under optimistic conditions, uh, are, are not there. But the middle corridor can serve a much more pressing need, which would be connecting Central Asia to the Caucasus, connecting it to Turkey, and connecting it to the Black Sea states, both via uh, maritime and via rail. And this would allow Central Asia and the Caucasus to essentially function as a coordinated and independent trade walk. And it will be particularly important for feeding um, exports to both Turkey and Ukraine, which will have very strong need for imports following reconstruction. If this were to occur, if this level of coordination in terms of infrastructure coordination is successfully developed, that allows uh, the middle quarter develop, to develop and it also creates a platform uh, for coordination in other fields, including energy and including ecology. And so now Japan will talk about some of the uh, ecological implications of trans-Caspian coordination. Thank you, Nathan. So as we're considering the niche of the Caspian Sea uh, in the light of war in Ukraine and increased interest over, about the Middle Corridor, it would be really important to look at the climate change and other factors that are influencing the overall ecology of the Caspian Sea. In the face of climate change, the Caspian is shrinking like a puddle under the uh, sitting under the sunlight. And you probably came across a lot of articles in the last two years talking about catastrophic level of Caspian, uh, Caspian Sea shrinking. Increasing uh, surface air temperature over the Caspian uh, is uh, been witnessed to increase by one Celsius since 1979, and it have resulted in increased evaporation and climate change is likely culprit. In fact, uh, the World Bank uh, reports that the average annual temperature in the region is expected to rise between one Celsius to five Celsius degrees by mid-2090s. Of course, that is dependent on initial pathways projections. Evidently, climate change is increasing evaporation over the Caspian Sea, which is not being balanced by river discharge from the tributary rivers due to excessive damming and lack of precipitation across the Caspian Basin due to occurrence of El Nino Southern Oscillation that increases the wind speed and leads the blowing moisture off the, off the coast to the east side of the basin. So as a result, uh, the Caspian Sea level is being observed to steadily shrink uh, since 1996. For example, research from the University of Texas at Austin wrote that the Caspian Sea is dropping almost seven centimeters and its uh, water level uh, will be reaching the lowest um, by 2030. Specifically, it is projected to drop uh, between eight to 30 meters by 2010. 
uh, 20 hundred, sorry. Uh, so the salination is an additional exacerbating factor for the Caspian Sea ecosystem and survival of it, and as well as uh, littoral states really depends on uh, taking under the consideration what factor uh, and what role of the salination plants are. Uh, I want to highlight that Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan, and Iran, and more recently Turkmenistan, been actively pursuing desalination. Uh, so uh, we came to conclusion uh, with Nathan that the Caspian's water balance can be exacerbated by desalination plants. Uh, this potentially can lead to ecolo ecological collapse of the Caspian Sea and can represent a major threat to the fragile ecosystem and food security in the region. Um, next slide, please. Uh, desalination is regarded by uh, techno-optimists as the magic bullet that could help overcome 21st century water shortages. However, desalination has a major social, political, and environmental implications. To illustrate the current state of art, seawater reverse osmosis plants emit between 1.4 to 1.8 kilograms of CO2 per cubic meter of produced water. Although in recent years, there were a number of technological innovations that reduce carbon footprint of desalination through energy recovery devices, and natural evaporation of brine water and advances in the membrane technology, the levels of greenhouse gas emissions from large scale desalination plants are still uh, a major concern and possesses certain threats to the ecosystem and ecology of the Caspian Sea. Uh, so as we know, the salination process separates feed water into two different streams, a freshwater stream and wastewater with high concentration of salt and chemical, also known as brine. On average, for every liter of fresh water output, desalination plants actually produce an average of 1.5 liters of brine. This is a lot uh, in comparison to one liter of output of fresh water. So the salination plants that are located in near the shorelines uh, uh, of the Caspian Sea uh, often discharge uh, untreated brine directly to the water of the Caspian. So that is in itself increases important ecologic, increases questions around ecological and environmental concerns. Uh, for example, brine disposal into the surface water, especially when it's untreated, uh, causes biochemical alterations, uh, such as increased salinity, which in turn then increases water temperature and accumulates lots of metals. Um, and in turn, that uh, leads to the endangered, endangering the species such as sturgeon, um, Caspian seals, uh, as well as clams and mussels in the, which live in the seafloor. Next slide, please. So uh, policy decisions amid, uh, aimed at addressing water shortages and basin management are often made without cross-sectorial coordination. For the Caspian neutral states, the adaptation, adaptation pathways, which is basically structured and dynamic approaches to planning uh, that allows policies to change over time in order to account for system change, new vulnerabilities and new opportunities, often cases overlooked. For example, the current convention on the legal status of the Caspian Sea has no language that explicitly addresses the impact of water extraction activities, such as through desalination plants and dams that impact the water level. The governance of transboundary rivers and seas falls under the customary international legal principles and international conventions. However, existing international water law does not explicitly discuss water argumentation processes like desalination, leaving a big question as the extent of legal principles and how they can be applied under the Convention of the Legal Status of the Caspian Sea. On the other hand, I want to highlight that the Convention of Law of Non-Navigational Uses of International Water Courses requires limited territorial sovereignty or limited territorial integrity, which asserts that every riparian state has the right to utilize international rivers waters, but must ensure that uh, use do not harm other riparian state. So in other words, um, 
discharge, more discharge should be allocated from tributary rivers. However, uh, Russia should be made to abide these international existing conventions uh, as it relates to Volga River, for example. The littoral state also uh, should revise or consider revising the Caspian Treaty language to recognize that the water of the Caspian uh, is a distinct resource along with fishing and minerals that it provides. Uh, specifically, Caspian littoral states could follow New, New Zealand's example and grant legal personhood status to tributary rivers and the Caspian Sea itself, thus allowing uh, tributary rivers and the Caspian Sea uh, to sue in the absence uh, of uh, needed action that threaten the, uh, the water itself and the rights of the water bodies to exist. Of course, this is quite an idealistic uh, course, but it is possible. Furthermore, oral state actors could consider adjustment of crop mixes to, to reduce the gross, uh, to reduce the demand on water. And specifically, we know that both Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan are cultivating cotton, which is considered to be a water extensive a crop. Uh, Nature-based solutions that, such as ex exploring more uh, karizes and takirs as nature-based indigenous solutions that is very much uh, in align with the local climate and context would be another solutions, solution, alternative solution to desalination plants. And finally, development banks also could con consider addressing the, this issue by providing finances for uh, adapting integrated uh, technologies such as uh, drip te water technologies, stormwater harvesting technologies during the wet season in order to supply fresh water, water recycling technologies, enhancing brine water management and repurposing systems. So in a nutshell, for the Caspian uh, to be preserved for trade, leisure and food sec security, all littoral states will need to ensure the sustainability of resources, sustainable use of uh, incoming water streams from tributary rivers and overall consider trade-offs and synergies among trade, energy, food environment nexus. Thank you. So yes, thank you, Jahan. And so basically the reason why we're focusing on this is because this is really a unique moment where we have these two major issues, both of which require extensive coordination. The trade requires coordination because the, the investments on one side have to correspond with the investments on the other. In ecology, again, the Caspian is a classic commons problem. You need a coordinated framework to address it effectively. And it's quite clear that the current legal framework is insufficient to, to do this. And so basically this is, this is really, we feel the Caspian's moment to solve both of these interconnected issues um, simultaneously and in tandem with each other. Um, so with that, I'll stop sharing my presentation and we can move on to Dr. Byron. Um, thank you very much, Nathan and uh, Jahan. Um, I have questions, but let's go to the second uh, second presentation. Agai, you actually, you're an expert on climate change uh, yourself, so I'm, I'm sure you'll have, uh, um, uh, you, 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 you'll share your thoughts on uh, what have just been said. Uh, but the topic we asked you to talk about is the energy governance. So let's let's go with that. I feel Great. free to uh, add uh, remarks. I'll share my uh, slides as well. Can you see it clearly? Yes. Yes. So, well, first of all, thanks so much, uh, Nargis and Nathan, for organizing this uh, event, timely panel discussion, and uh, inviting me as well. Uh, indeed, I'll talk about briefly on uh, energy governance, uh, especially some challenges. Uh, well, this presentation is based on my uh, paper that I published in 2020, and I'll try to kind of update what has changed uh, since then, especially since also 2018. So the starting point of this presentation regarding the energy uh, governance and the developments is the legal status of the convention. So. Uh, as you know, the uh, Caspian Littoral States uh, signed the uh, agreement uh, in 2018. And uh, the question is, what has uh, changed uh, since then? Uh, what are the developments? Overall, uh, when we look at the uh, Littoral States, uh, let's say, uh, the convention, uh, the legal convention, we can see that 
uh, it is very broad, uh, but also it is very narrow in a sense. Uh, the broad because it covers uh, diverse uh, topics like regional security, environmental protection, uh, navigation, and most important uh, is the construction of uh, pipelines, submarine uh, pipelines. Uh, and overall, uh, since then, uh, the littoral states uh, have uh, ratified the uh, convention. However, only one uh, state is the Iran that hasn't ratified it yet. And even uh, a few years ago in Moscow, uh, Russia, actually Russian foreign uh, minister, uh, mentioned this, uh, that okay, Iran is the only one who hasn't uh, ratified, so we need to move ahead and waiting Iran. So the question is, or when we look at the developments between the Caspian Sea countries, especially between Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan, uh, we can see some positive developments related to the legal status or uh, broadly, I would say, related to as well. The first thing is the agreement between the Turkmenistan uh, and Azerbaijan. Uh, the previously it's called the uh, Chapas or the Sardar um, energy field uh, that uh, was not uh, or hasn't uh, exploited and uh, explored yet. Uh, and then uh, both uh, countries signed uh, 2021, uh, January, uh, agreement uh, and called the field a dos look field. It's called a friendship field. Uh, so um, this is one of the positive developments. Of course, some experts link this to the Caspian uh, legal convention because it also uh, created a positive development and showed the uh, room for cooperation among the Caspian Sea countries. Uh, but it is also related to bilateral uh, relationship and also uh, cooperation and uh, engagement between Azerbaijan and uh, Turkmenistan. So the question is, uh, how can uh, this uh, energy field, which uh, approximately uh, includes uh, 30 BCM gas and uh, up to 100 million uh, oil. Uh, well, this number uh, is not fully exact. Uh, there is a working group and they are a joint working group between Turkmenistan and Azerbaijan. They are looking for options to uh, transport and uh, explore the field. Exactly. Uh, and then the question is, uh, what are the uh, possibilities and the ways to transport oil and gas from this field? Well, another the development that uh, we can look is the uh, Southern Gas Corridor, which uh, uh, completed and transported uh, first natural gas 2020 to the European market. Uh, this is one of the options actually can provide uh, a room, uh, an option uh, to transport the uh, natural gas from the Dostluk field uh, to the European market. Uh, and uh, overall, as we know, uh, it's not the only pipeline uh, or the only infrastructure project. And uh, previously, uh, Baku Tbilisi uh, Jehan oil pipeline was also operational, and Turkmenistan and Kazakhstan have used this uh, oil pipeline to transport their uh, oil uh, via uh, Azerbaijan to the world market. So, in this regard, the practice is already there. And uh, of course, uh, uh, in my PhD dissertation, I also looked at the infrastructure projects in, in uh, three phases, the planning, construction, and the post-construction phases. Although in the planning and the construction phases, we see and hear more geopolitical discussions, but when the infrastructure is there, it is kind of a functional uh, option or the cooperation option for the Caspian Sea uh, littoral state. So in this regard, the uh, Southern Gas Corridor is also, in addition to the uh, Baku Tbilisi Jehan pipeline, is another way to transport the uh, uh, natural gas, and uh, Baku Tbilisi Jehan is the one to transport the uh, uh, oil. Uh, and the most important thing uh, after the signing uh, uh, convention status and also the uh, all these developments regarding the Dostluk field and the Southern Gas Corridor is the big question is Transcaspian pipeline. And every year this topic and this project uh, receive uh, political, policy, academic attention and media attention. So when we look at the developments again since 2018, we can see that Iran, Turkmenistan and Azerbaijan have uh, signed a gas swap deal. Although this uh, deal was more uh, addressed Azerbaijan's internal use of the gas, so it wasn't uh, uh, 
aimed for the exportation of the natural gas, but still uh, it is a positive development. So it is one of the options to show that the uh, cooperation between the Caspian littoral states is going on and uh, regarding the energy, by the way. And the um, Trans-Caspian pipeline, uh, the project idea is to transport the uh, uh, natural gas from Turkmenistan via Azerbaijan to the European market. So one option could be uh, swap deals. So that could be there. Uh, and when we look at the recent statements from the uh, leaders of the Caspian littoral state, for example, Azerbaijan, the uh, president said, uh, Ilham said that, uh, still, there is no clarity regarding the project. So that is a high level uh, comment on this project. Uh, Azerbaijan supports this the project, but the biggest question is who is going to take financial and political lead for this uh, project? Uh, because it will cost approximately five up to 11 billion, depends on the capacity, infrastructure, uh, the marketing, and so far, so on. And there are a few options. The one is the pipeline, uh, undersea pipeline, which the uh, legal status uh, already facilitates this, or a gas swap, which practice is already there. And the, finally, uh, the LNG option, but there is no infrastructure in the uh, Azerbaijani cost yet. And uh, when we look at the broader picture, we can see that the most important thing indeed is the capacity uh, and infrastructure. Although the Southern Gas Corridor is uh, operational now, but it doesn't have the capacity to transport significant amount of Turkmen gas uh, to the European market. So it doesn't have it yet, but it needs to be uh, expanded. So in the first place, the infrastructure capacity is the most important thing. And the second thing is the time frame. Uh, well, right now, again, the Trans-Caspian pipeline is a popular topic and they receive uh, important political media attention is because of the Ukrainian war as well, because right now EU is trying to decrease, even cut fully the Russian uh, energy resources. And instead of that, looking for an alternative source. An alternative source is one of them is Azerbaijan is already providing. Another one is expanding the market to the the Central Asia, so Turkmenistan. However, uh, the time frame is very important because uh, even if Turkmenistan agrees and Azerbaijan find the common solution for this financial uh, capacity, European Union wants, uh, wants it now or within uh, a year, but this is not uh, possible. So time frame is also not. And the uh, third thing is Turkmenistan energy policy, in addition to uh, positive neutrality of Turkmenistan and not trying to be a uh, partner with any regional powers or external powers. Turkmenistan prefers long-term contract, energy contract plus 30 BCM demand, not five or six BCM. And that was the uh, information uh, leaked uh, to the US diplomats that Turkmenistan said, well, it should be long-term because we need to receive a guarantee from the European Union that after the Ukrainian war, uh, the demand will not decrease or uh, because of the energy transition. So sorry, we had the problem back then. Now we don't have, or we don't need your gas. So that uh, is the question. Turkmenistan doesn't want to deal with. And finally, uh, who will pay this uh, pipeline project? Although there are legal uh, leadership wise uh, positive developments but the question is who is going to pay uh, uh, this financially the uh, uh, construction of the uh, trans-caspian pipeline so here it's not only the uh, financial uh, payment but also politically uh, geopolitically uh, and also commitment political commitment is also important in addition to the caspian littoral states uh, the project needs uh, international financial institutions, energy companies, their support as well. For example, the Dos Duk field, uh, while the working group is looking for an option to uh, transport the energy sources, uh, Russian oil company Lukoil uh, wants to be one of the uh, partners or the interested in the project. So in this regard, uh, who is going to invest in, uh, in this uh, project? So even if there is a political will and political support, it doesn't mean that natural gas will be transported from Caspian Sea to the European market. So there should be financial uh, uh, commitment and investment 
to this project. So overall, when we look at the Caspian Sea uh, energy governance uh, since 2018, the littoral states, we could see that while there are some positive developments, the options to transport uh, natural gas is already there, infrastructure is already there, legal ground is already there, and there is to some extent a, a political will, but the most important question is still not uh, there, and that is the financial burden, who is going to finance this uh, project. So I would like to uh, end my brief presentation here and then uh, look for the uh, questions uh, regarding maybe Ukrainian war and it is influence to the uh, energy governance in the Caspian Sea region as well. Well, thank you so much. Uh, for listening. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, again. Very, very informative. Um, Ambassador Master, can we go to you from the vantage point of your uh, knowledge and experience? How does the situation look? What's what's desirable? What's feasible? Well, of course, I'm cursed with uh, uh, two uh, academic backgrounds. I, I'm both a political scientist and an economist. So when I look at these issues, uh, I look at it from both points of view. And when I look at the middle corridor, it's called the middle corridor because it lies between two corridors. And we've talked a lot about the northern corridor, but we haven't talked about the southern corridor, which goes through Iran. And the reason we have emphasis on the middle corridor is because uh, we're having geopolitical problems with both Russia and Iran. How is Russia responding to this? Uh, and how is Iran responding to this? I wanna to touch on that. If we look at the middle corridor, and if you think back to the maps that the previous presenters have shown, uh, there are two countries that are critical on the Eastern side of the Caspian Sea to the middle corridor, and they are Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan. That is where the Russians are putting pressure. And right now we've seen a Russian full court press on Turkmenistan with recent visits within the last two months from Prime Minister Mishustin, from uh, Speaker of the Duma Volodyan, and uh, two visits in the, within the last year from the Deputy Prime Minister for the Agro-Industrial Complex, uh, Alexei Overchuk. There's a lot of attention being given by the Russians to the middle corridor with the intention of blocking it. And once, uh, if the uh, Russians are successful in getting Turkmenistan not to pursue a middle corridor due to political pressure, next they'll go to work on Kazakhstan, which has uh, a very, very long border with Russia. So that's where I see Russia coming in is putting a lot of pressure on the Turkmen and on the Kazakhs to keep the middle corridor from happening. Uh, the Iranians have come up uh, recently and said that they're prepared to pursue a swap, but uh, to expand it to go to 15 billion cubic meters uh, with a pipeline. The current pipeline that connects Turkmenistan to Azerbaijan through Iran uh, is is quite old. Uh, sections of it were uh, built and were, were inaugurated 50 years ago. Uh, and and to, to give you a perspective on that, uh, the opening of that pipeline between Iran and then the Soviet Union and Azerbaijan was presided over by the Shah of Iran and uh, Soviet Prime Minister Alexei Kosygin. So, that infrastructure is quite old. It would not be that expensive to replace, uh, probably about a billion dollars or so. But again, how do you do that with Iran under the sanctions? So that's where I see the geopolitical construct right now. That's, that's the playing field. And the Iranians are pushing their project, saying they want to expand the swap, they want to expand a delivery of natural gas, either to Azerbaijan or to Turkey. And then of course the Russians are simply trying to block the middle corridor. Now, what kind of signs of hope do we see? Uh, last month, roughly a month ago, uh, Deputy Foreign Minister Vepa Hajiyev visited Brussels uh, specifically to talk about energy. This is the first sign that we've seen in five years that the Turkmen are willing to reach out to the European Union because uh, the previous the previ only previous visit was in 2018, in October of 2018, by then Deputy Prime Minister Murat Geldi Meredev, uh, who was the Deputy Prime Minister for Oil and Gas. 
He came back from that visit empty handed. There was no movement, but of course, geopolitically, things have changed in the last year. And Europe is suddenly vastly more interested in Turkmen energy than it was five years ago. So uh, we have seen some movement on that. We also see some movement from Kazakhstan uh, due to some concerns about the Caspian uh, pipeline consortium pipeline that goes from Kazakhstan to Novorossiysk. Uh, the fact that the Russians have played games with that pipeline and the Kazakhs are looking at what opportunities they may have for some sort of other delivery mechanism to get oil out to the West. Uh, the, current, uh, the current view is that they can increase the number of tankers on the Caspian and uh, increase output of oil through the uh, Baku to Belize Jehan pipeline. I question and many others question whether that can actually substitute <clears throat> for the CPC pipeline. Capacity wise, it probably cannot. So the alternative would be a uh, Trans-Caspian oil pipeline. Feasibility study for that was completed in 2012 um, uh, by, by the United States, by KBR, uh, paid for by the US government. So that, that technically is feasible, but coming back to what Aga said, it comes down to money because that pipeline would cost uh, somewhere, as he said, between five and $11 billion. And we just don't think that there are any international oil companies out there or major investors who would be interesting in committing that kind of money to another massive hydrocarbon project, uh, given the emphasis on shifting to renewables and also given the time lags involved. Because as, as Aga correctly said, Europe wants the energy now. These sorts of projects would take years to implement and, and uh, see through to completion. So uh, where do we stand? Uh, Turkmenistan says it wants a 30 billion cubic meter pipeline. Um, that has a, a couple of problems. One of them is the cost, uh, a 30 billion cubic meter uh, per year gas pipeline would cost about $8 billion to construct. That money is not there. If it were built, you would then have a problem with offtake because the Southern Gas Corridor cannot accommodate another 30 billion cubic meters. It can take another maybe five right now. And if expanded, could take another 10 to 12 on top of what Azerbaijan is going to produce. So we have some downstream problems there as well. Um, I, I want to really underscore here the time dimension. Europe wants natural gas now. The shortest period for getting natural gas to Europe uh, would be by exploiting associated gas in the Caspian from existing wells. There are existing wells for oil and condensate that produce associated gas that currently is either being flared or is being re-injected. That natural gas could be captured, could be piped to Azerbaijan and could go into the Southern Gas Corridor. It's not a massive amount. It's probably uh, somewhere around five to maybe as much as 10 to 12 billion cubic meters a year, but that would be enough to fill the Southern Gas Corridor and deliver at least as far as Turkey uh, possibly some of it could go onward as far as, as Europe. I'll stop there. That's in broad brush, uh, the situation as I see it. And uh, we can go to Q&A. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, maybe a couple of clarifying questions. Uh, you mentioned the Rus Russia's uh, activization in Turkmenistan, in, in the rest of Central Asia, Kazakhstan, uh, Uzbekistan, and Mila goes there all the time. And you know, um, what is Russia's plan? What what do they what do they want? And uh, also, what do um, what do Turkmen's want? How well, do what Russia wants, uh, I think, is continued dominance of Central Asia politically. Um, Russia has largely abdicated the economic dimension to China. Uh, China is the dominant, dominant force in Central Asian economics. That's very clear. 
but in terms of political pressure and the ability to get Central Asian countries to knuckle under to the Kremlin, that's really what they want. I, I don't know if I would uh, call it a strategy because I'm not sure the Russians have a strategy with regard to Central Asia, but they certainly have a desire simply to keep the Central Asians in, in the Kremlin, Kremlin's fold. Um, and in terms of what the Central Asians want, what I'm hearing is that there is a rising sense of what one of my Kazakh friends called uh, mental, uh, he called it mental sovereignty. He said, we've had political sovereignty for 30 years. We've had economic sovereignty for 30 years, but mentally we have not considered ourselves to be fully sovereign states. We've still had this mentality that we were somehow subordinate to the Kremlin. And he says, we're shaking that off finally. After 30 years, we're getting to the point that we're now realizing we're independent countries and we can do what we bloody well want. So this growing awareness that Central Asian countries are independent, they are sovereign, uh, they can follow their own foreign policy courses is, is I think changing the attitude of Central Asian states towards Russia towards the West, towards China. Well, it's I think it's more or less clear what Kazakhs want, um, and there has been this push to develop, uh, mm -hmm. to diversify, to develop the Trans-Caspian uh, mm -hmm. transportation system, and, and and all that for 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 some time. And uh, and uh, for Kazakhstan, you know, kind of the domestic consumption of domestic gasification is very important. So it's not so much kind of you know exporting it to to you know other other places but what's what does Turkmenistan want and you know what what game do you think they play basically you know kind of strengthening these relations with with Russia and you know kind of looking around what what uh, as a Turk, like really a big Turkmenistan expert how do you how do you see them because it's much less transparent you know what uh, what they want well Turkmenistan is run by one family and that family wants regime survival. So if you look at it through that prism, you can see that any policy direction that Turkmenistan pursues will be driven by that imperative, uh, the desire for regime survival. Uh, part and parcel of that is permanent neutrality, the idea of Turkmenistan as a neutral state with uh, no enemies, but no friends. Um, and therefore able to talk to anybody at any time, uh, which is at times it's an advantage, at times it's a disadvantage. But for now, what I see Turkmenistan simply wanting to do is find some way of diversifying its export routes without incurring the wrath of uh, someone who might come in and uh, do them some damage. Uh, and that's a balancing act. It's a very similar balancing act to what the Kazakhs uh, have to have to perform. Uh, and that's that means that in, aside from Turkmenistan's current utter dependence on China as an export destination for natural gas, the Turkmen really would like to find export routes to other customers, uh, particularly to the West. But there is that constraint of opposition from Russia. Hey, okay. um, th thank you very much. Can I give an opportunity to to other panelists to to make Please. yes remarks? Thank so you. yes, uh, I, I would say uh, yeah, th th that's a good point about we are, we need to not just focus on the northern corridor but also the southern corridor. And so there had been efforts to talk about routes through Afghanistan uh, to Pakistan or to Chabahar in Iran, and so those that was being pursued alongside the middle corridor very aggressively by different uh, development banks uh, prior to uh, the uh, prior to the fall of the Afghan government. Uh, now that's been complicated, but as you mentioned, the route through Iran that could be via rail, could even be via truck is, is still viable. And some shippers were rerouting through Iran um, when, when the war first broke out as well. So that is another uh, in a sense, competitor. But as you see, we, we need all the capacity we can get. 
So that is also an, another option. And there are also, in terms of the Caspian, there's also the international north-south border between yeah. Russia and Iran, which is, adds another uh, element of complexity to this, to this whole governance uh, challenge. Well, the, the, the Turkmen are continuing to build at the rate of about 20 kilometers per year, very slowly, the rail line uh, between uh, Serhedabat and Herat, with the intention of connecting with an Iranian rail line that is coming in from Khaf to Herat, which would then give Central Asia for the first time a rail outlet to the, the port of Chabahar. Mm -hmm. uh, and if that gets built, uh, that will help relieve some of the congestion and, and some of the demand for uh, access to, to uh, an outside seaport. But it's going very, very slowly. And I think um, I wanted to be briefly reflect on uh, what Alan and Nathan said. I think here we shouldn't only consider uh, Iran and Russia uh, geopolitical perspective, but also geoeconomically, because Iran and Russia can be convinced uh, regarding the future energy project if their companies are involved. So if they also financially receive some yeah. benefit, I think that is the way. Because the uh, way I look at the, uh, the developments, uh, they don't want to be isolated financially because they know that, as Ellen said, uh, Turkmenistan or Kazakhstan or Azerbaijan will not change their a political direction fully towards West or China and isolate either Iran or uh, Russia. They like to balance it, either uh, balance it with another region. They, I think here the for the Caspian Sea, not South Caucasus, or Central Asia, the financial uh, benefits, uh, gains are the most important thing. For example, when I look at the Dostok field, or the, or the Southern Gas Corridor, the Iranian company, uh, Russian companies, they are interested in and part of it. So I think in the future, any project, as long as they include somehow 10% uh, share of the Iranian and uh, Russian companies, I think the, there will be a common ground uh, for the projects, but... Mm -hmm. but... But does it, does it mean that um what Russia and Iran can do is sort of on a smaller scale. Uh, well, they, they, they develop along with the India, this international north-south uh, uh, transport corridor, mm -hmm. and you know, Russia promised major investments to, to Iran in the oil fields, although now there's some leaked information that uh, Russian companies are not thrilled about it. Uh, they're not ready to invest that, that much money. So they are constrained. They are constrained by sanctions and the infrastructure you know, needs to be built and and they are not in a good uh, in a good shape. So mm -hmm. it seems that there will be push, but are, are we thinking that that uh, they cannot do much? It's sort of it will be happening, but it will be happening in a very kind of constrained uh, constrained way. And Russia will not be able to kind of take Central Asia along with it, kind of building this north south uh, you know uh, corridors uh, zone. Well, when it comes to Russia and Iran, of course, the elephant in the room is the sanctions. Um, and, and the sanctions, uh, the sanctions are, of course, targeted. There are carve outs for natural gas. There are carve outs for, for certain other products. But what we're finding with the sanctions is that uh, Western companies and in particular Western financial institutions, the banks, uh, engage in what we call overcompliance. Uh, they want to comply with the sanctions, but then they look at the sanctions and say, they can only get worse. And if we start something now, commit money, and then the sanctions are expanded, we run the risk of losing our investment and uh, having to withdraw. And the, everybody's looking at what, for example, uh, the major international oil companies did in Russia when sanctions were imposed and they began to pull out. Uh, BP wrote off, uh, I think it was BP or ExxonMobil. ExxonMobil wrote off uh, $25 billion when it pulled out of Russia. Shell wrote off uh, about uh, two or three billion, I think. So you're talking about massive amounts of money that people are not willing to risk by investing in infrastructure projects that involve the Russians and the Iranians right now. And that's a problem. 
that's a constraint. And, and yes, you're absolutely right, Aga. If we could give 10% to the Russians, 10% to the, to the Iranians, a lot of these object, objections would just dissipate. People would get on board, say, yes, it's a great project. We want it to happen. Uh, look at the fact that, that, that uh, Dostluk was blessed by the Russians as soon as Luke Oil said that it was going to become the, the developer of record. Uh, is that going to happen anytime soon? I suspect not, simply because of overcompliance with sanctions, uh, particularly by financial institutions. Right. Um, okay. So um, we uh, we had a number of questions. Um, and Jahan, sorry, sorry. Can I can I go to you? Uh, if yeah, if if you want to say something. I think uh, I received one interesting question in the chat box by Timothy in regards to its uh, desalination objectives. And for each country, uh, objectives for building desalination plants are various, while for Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan, the coast, uh, coastal cities do not have access to fresh water, or if they have, it's very limited. Groundwater is has high salinity, um, so it was decided back in the decades to build the salination plants uh, to supply drinking water uh, for Aktau as well as uh, Turkmenbashi city. Uh, however, uh, pre preliminary research findings in regards for Iran, for example, uh, say that they are utilizing the salination plants uh, to use for irrigation purposes. And actually the most desalination plants are built in the territory of uh, Iran. Um, the quantities of the salination water that is being proposed, uh, yeah, there, there is uh, limited information on a new uh, new desalination plants that are being built right now. Uh, so, for example, Iran is um, considering to build a new one. It's announced that news in 2021, and they projected desalination capacity on new plant that is going to be constructed is uh, 6 uh, million cubic meters per day. It's a lot. Uh, Turkmenistan also announced potential of uh, studying a new uh, plant, which might be built in future. That announcement actually was the reason why they picked my curiosity why it's being constructed. So that one is projected to, to be around one over one million uh, cubic meters per day. So overall, if you do uh, calculations based on the data we managed to mine, uh, then the overall um, uh, production of uh, water in 2020, production of desalinated water in 2020 was uh, 199 billion cubic meters per year. And then when you compare that against the data on evaporation and how much water is coming through the dams and all Chibuchi rivers uh, have several dams. So the water inflow was little and then lack of precipitation due to climate change and El Nino, then definitely um, desalinization is also contributing uh, to the shrinking of the Caspian Sea. Uh, then other question was, who is leading these efforts? Um, the efforts are primarily led by the government itself. There is an interest to provide more water for citizens, for municipal use, drinking water and irrigation. And some countries um, such as Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan uh, have been consulting um, international private sector organizations that are producing innovative technologies. And, and there are uh, banks such as uh, European Bank for Construction and Development that is sponsoring uh, some of the these desalination plant constructions. I guess you want to ask something. Yes, thank, thank you. Actually, can I can I link environment and politics? Um, to what extent environmental concerns, both genuine and fake, um, can kind of constrain the development of this uh, infrastructure of the uh, of the middle corridor uh, of the uh, well, potentially the pipelines um, that, yeah, uh, let, let me start with that. If, who, who has? I would, I would say um, one, one yeah. other way in, the, in which these two ideas are connected is that we're talking about desalination, not only for agricultural purposes, but also for 
uh, new urban construction. So Turkmen Bashi is not only envisioned as a port, it's also envisioned as a as a large city, a larger city, which would rely very much on desalination. Octal as well relies on desalination. So if we're going to be building up you know, industrial clusters or logistics clusters, uh, major job creators, um, and for a lot, a lot as well in Azerbaijan, that will feed into the uh, need for additional fresh water resources. So that would be another way in which the, the, the ability to gr continue to grow uh, that uh, cross Caspian commerce would be tied to water availability. And so they're not, they're not independent issues. They are in, in that way connected as well. But, but at the same time, I can't imagine other little states like, you know, trying to block the construction of, you know, kind of industrial infrastructure in Turkmenistan, but, uh, but you know, they can try blocking the, the pipeline, for example. Right? Yeah, well, on, on that, on that yeah. score, uh, the Russians sent a very clear signal with a couple of papers published by uh, MMO, uh, the Institute for International Economics and uh, uh, International Relations in Moscow in 2018, right after the uh, uh, agreement was signed, the convention was signed, and then another paper in 2019, basically spelling out that if anybody were to try to build a pipeline across the Caspian, Russia would object on environmental grounds. They realize they can't really stop something between two littoral states. Uh, legally, that would be very difficult to, to, to stop, but uh, environmental issues affect the entire condominium of the five. Mm -hmm. and they would object on those grounds. They've already laid that marker down. So there is your very clear nexus between politics and the environment. Yeah, and uh, the explosion of the Nord Stream uh, uh, 2, is it is it a factor? Um... I don't think so, not really, because natural gas pipelines don't present the kind of environmental risk that oil pipelines do. Uh, yes, there was a lot of methane that was released, but in terms of damage to uh, sea life and marine life and, and, and to the environment, uh, the natural gas bubbles to the surface and it dissipates. It's more of a carbon footprint problem than uh, a problem to uh, marine life. Uh, and the same would be true in, in the Caspian. Uh, you're, you're worried more with natural gas about leakage leading to a higher ca uh, carbon footprint. But it doesn't make it uh, costlier, no? Uh, I mean, they, they kind of... In terms uh, of risk? You mean? Risk, yeah, yeah. assurance. Oh, sure. Yeah. You're, going to, you're going to have the risks. You're going to have insurance premiums. You're going to have all of that. But the, this, is, this is not new. Mm -hmm. uh, this has all been factored into construction of pipelines. And there are already hundreds of miles of pipelines in the Caspian Sea for both oil and gas. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I think <laughs> environmental yeah, things... Mm -hmm. No, no, I think I agree with the Nathan that uh, water is the main thing for them, this uh, clean water stuff. But on the other hand, the biggest question I think for the Caspian Sea countries, how can we keep the current economic income uh, without too much sacrificing the environment? Maybe uh, environment is not the first uh, priority uh, out of 10 policy uh, options, uh, but it is, uh, I think, part of it. Uh, and I think here environment needs to be considered not only by the littoral states, but again by the companies as well. I remember back then when uh, I was doing a PhD interview by the private companies, uh, experts from the or the people from uh, British Petroleum, they said, we try to be as careful as possible because any damage will cost us a lot of money, uh, punishment from the Azerbaijani government because we have to pay. And uh, not because just Azerbaijan care about the environment per se, but also it's a nice source, you know, like so company needs to careful here. And then uh, uh, the, the person blame more the soccer that, okay, they are less careful than us. So here the companies also play this, uh, play this card. So monitoring system from the government. And regarding the Russia, they have built uh, two undersea pipelines uh, to Europe, right? So it would be very ironic to build on the one hand to Europe, on the other hand say you shouldn't build. But I remember back then, uh, maybe Ambassador 
remembers better than me is that the Baku Tbilisi Jehan pipeline also received a lot of environmental protests. Uh, similar to the southern gas corridor even in italy and back then it was about the olive trees uh, the tourism the puglia region which is very poor and the, uh, in terms of income they are mainly receiving from olive trees and the tourism and that time it was uh, again considered about the russian involvement there but still so i think uh, indeed environment can play in the short term a play to find the in the long term if there is a financial will or the uh, kind of share uh, this will also be disappeared uh, and in terms of the uh, geopolitical risk again looking at russia and again and Aga, you mentioned this as well earlier about uh, dagestan and the fact that when you see seawater water loss from the caspian sea even though you know turkmenistan is probably the most water stressed country in the region it's really going to be Russia and Kazakhstan that bear the brunt of the cost in terms of uh, the environmental catastrophe from sea level loss. And that will primarily impact Dagestan, which is one of the poorest regions of, of, of Russia. Uh, so that could also be destabilizing. So that that's why even though environmental issues don't typically rise to the forefront, environmental issues that are so, you know, like these that, that are supporting like the local economy in Dagestan that relies on fishing and other traditional mm -hmm. industries could be seen as, as a, you know, a potential reason why you could see more coordination than you might otherwise expect. Nathan, I would just point out that in your presentation, you and Jahan pointed out that the Caspian Sea level could drop by as much as eight meters. And I would just point out that the, uh, the depth, uh, the depth uh, uh, of uh, the Turkmenbashi seaport is eight meters. So mm -hmm. if you see an eight meter drop, Turkmenbashi seaport uh, goes the way of the Buffalo. It'll look like the seaport of Ephesus. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of buffaloes and uh, so white white elephants um, that you mentioned, Nathan, uh, which white elephants in the making kind of we might see? Well, I mean, if we look at what what we have to see, what's the what's the uh, weakest link in the chain currently? And so right now you have two ports on the east feeding one port on the west. And so there's a lot of pressure on Azerbaijan to expand capacity of the port of a lot uh, and also the rail connections, the Azerbaijani rail connections, which are, are more problematic because of the topography compared to the, the rail uh, sections in, in both Kazakhstan uh, and, and Turkmenistan. And so that that would be one potential constraint is if, if uh, for example, Azerbaijan were to expand based upon the assumption that this middle quarter traffic is going to continue to grow, and then that doesn't doesn't happen, then then they could be left with a lot of underutilized port capacity or uh, vessel acquisitions that are incredibly expensive, uh, and or rail investments that turn out that they they were building for a containerized system and they needed to be building for more bulk capacity, which have different operating characteristics. So those are the types of sort of first mover types of issues that you would see would potentially complicate uh, the coordination of investment. And it, like you said, even if there's an agreement amongst the parties, there could be external parties like Russia or like someone else has a different agenda that could could compl uh, complicate those, those investment coordination. Thank you. Nargis, did you drop off? Yes, I think uh, yeah, she, 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 we may have lost her. Uh, we have some questions here that people have been posing. Should we answer them? Yes, yes, let's do. All um, right, well, why don't I read one and then uh, you guys um, can figure out. The EU and the United States, among others, include human rights as a priority and partnerships and cooperation with the Caspian and Central Asian states, for example, see the 2019 new EU strategy on Central Asia. With the current urgencies and opportunities of the middle corridor, do you anticipate a greater or lesser commitment to human rights improvements within the region and among Western countries that are actively engaged in the region? Uh, that was sent by Leslie McMillan. Who wants to answer that? I think that might be a question for you, Alan, first. Oh, you think so, huh? Okay. <laughs> Okay, well, I'm going to say that human rights have always been a priority with the EU and the United States, and I don't see a change. I don't, I don't foresee a change in uh, the stance of the United States 
uh, or the EU in terms of the commitment to human rights. Um, uh, it's going to continue to be there, but uh, we're also going to continue with uh, talking to the Central Asians and, and everybody else about energy uh, because of the geopolitical situation. I, I just don't foresee a change. I'm sorry. Nar I Nargis, we, we took the bit in our teeth and, and ran yeah. with it. So we're answering the questions now. And we just exactly. answered the first question from uh, Leslie McMillan. Um, and yes. uh, now now there's a question from uh, Marsha McGraw-Olive. Uh, uh, but Jahan has the hand up. Oh, but Jahan yeah. has her hand up. Yeah, I think I would also just a little bit uh, compliment uh, your answer, um, Mr. Master, in regards to Leslie's question. Um, also, if we look at the um, United States um, strategy for Central Asia uh, for 2019 and 2025, it explicitly states that there is an interest to advance human rights. Mm -hmm. However, given sensitivities around overall starting off conversation with the Universal Decla Declaration of Human Rights can be very sensitive in the context of uh, Central Asian states. And I think while I agree with you, uh, Mr. Master, that the uh, appetite for advancing human rights will not decrease, evidently, at least till 2025. Um, the, the way that is being packaged and approached uh, should be really refined and thoughtful in order to create collaboration and partnership as opposed to agitation and loss of relationship. And I truly believe that U.S. Um, cannot comment much on uh, European Union, but U.S. was doing successful jobs through capacity building initiatives and looking at the partnership across environmental projects uh, through the USAID pro uh, projects in Turkmenistan specifically, as well as uh, Kazakhstan. Thank you. My, my experience has been that uh, human rights dialogues are best conducted behind closed doors uh, with very open uh, conversations. If you come out and start naming and shaming, uh, take it out before the public, it tends to be counterproductive, which I don't think is very well appreciated. So there's often a lot going on in terms of the human rights dialogue that's not visible to the general public because we, we're more interested in being effective than we are in scoring points. Yeah. Um, well, together with connection, I lost all the uh, all the questions, but I remember. Uh, well, do you want me to read the questions? next one? Then I remember. I remember <laughs> Marsha's question uh, on the gas uh, gas union, uh, this trilateral uh, gas union that Russia tried uh, tried to do with uh, yeah. Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. Um, and although both uh, both Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan said no, thank you, uh, we do see roadmap signed, bilateral roadmap signed. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, by by both Central Asian uh, countries with Russia and uh, new contracts uh, and, and and so on. So, but at the same time there are scandals, right? Uh, breaking out like uh, the recent uh, investigation by Radio Free uh, Europe, Radio Liberty, on the connections uh, between Uzbek elites and you know Russian elites, Gazprom and, and and all that. So it's very complex. It seems a very complex game is uh, is underway. How do we see it? Well, there's a lot of money at stake. And so obviously uh, it's going to be complex uh, for, for no other reason than that. Uh, but again, I come back to uh, one of the early comments about how the Central Asians are starting to realize that they are mentally sovereign as well as politically and economically sovereign. So uh, Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan are not going to be forward leaning in terms of any sort of relationship that creates a dependency on Russia. They'll do it if they're forced to, if they have no other choice. But if there's a, another way of doing it that doesn't create that dependency relationship, they'll still steer clear of it. And, and I, I think that's going to be the trend into the future. And it seems one way of doing it, an important way of doing it, is to kind of stick closer together, right? Yeah. Some, some yeah. sort of regional, regional cooperation, coordination. And uh, we do see kind of Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan getting closer uh closer together mm -hmm. and signing um signing interesting documents uh and uh well and Nathan you mentioned that it would be good to have uh to have some some sort of regional trade block right mm -hmm. um and uh, well uh, the middle corridor is connecting actually central asia and south caucasus 
And perhaps for us, it will be a game changer. Maybe it will not be as important for, for you know, for bigger players, but but for, for the regions, it's uh, kind of, it can be big if it works. Uh, so kind of, how can we get there, uh, given the complex, complex politics of the of the region and, you know, problems with governance and so on and so forth? Well, I mean, I think one one part we haven't talked about is Uzbekistan, and Uzbekistan, I think, also needs to be brought into this conversation because, you know, it, it's not it it doesn't share you know border with with the Caspian, but it is incredibly important for Uzbekistan to be able to diversify their export portfolio. They have to generate a tremendous amount of uh, manufacturing jobs to diversify their economy, and they have to be able to find markets for those manufactured goods. Um, and so that is, again, another key development opportunity for, for the middle corridor. It's not necessarily just transiting uh, from China. It's also um, manufactured goods that could be you know, inputs that could arrive from China or could arrive from South Korea, be manufactured and exported uh, to markets in Europe or, or in Turkey as well. And so that would be, I think, another sort of player to, to involve. And the, the question, it's really the question of, is it a Caspian, you know, arrangement, in which case, you know, it could tie in those countries that directly border, but may leave out Uzbekistan's interests, or how do we, how do we tie in that party uh, uh, as well? And, and, and so I, I think that, you know, it really depends on which countries are, 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 are central to the discussion and also how do you tie in the Black Sea? I think another risk that we have to think about is the maritime risk on the Black Sea is, is being elevated right now because of the mines and because of the, the potential resumption of, uh, of, of war in the, you know, in the desert as well. So that is also, I think, a constraint, might be a constraint on the growth of, of the Middle Corridor. And so that's another reason why the resolution of, of the war is very essential, I think, for the Middle Corridor's uh, development. Well, Uzbekistan is looking at the Middle Corridor and yeah. they've, been, they've been taking mm -hmm. some, some steps and signing signing some agreements. Mm -hmm. So that they, are, they are looking all around. Mm -hmm. um, for Central Asia, you, you can kind of see a clear rationale for developing, for developing mm -hmm. this, uh, this corridor. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the interest of the uh, of the countries of the South Caucasus, I want to go to you, Aga, because I understand you want to be more connected to Europe. What about the Central Asian part? Kind of, what's the interest? Uh, what's the interest there? I think um, the interest here is uh, also kind of pushed uh, by Turkey as well, because that's the kind of not new but kind of emerging power in the, in the Central Asia, because this idea of Turkish states. Uh, was already there, but was not popular. Uh, um, and uh, Turkey actually is the one pushing this middle corridor. And it started to gain importance after the Ukrainian invasion, uh, the idea of the middle corridor for Azerbaijan as well, uh, because uh, Azerbaijan uh, saw an opportunity, trade opportunity, uh, and kind of replacing uh, not replacing, but offering diversity not only to Europe and China, but also Central Asian states. Kind of, I see uh, increasing cooperation uh, and contact between Central Asia and Azerbaijan. Even some scholars argue that Azerbaijan, considering the Caspian Sea, is also part of Central Asia, broadly speaking. So uh, it's not uh, only... It doesn't belong only to South Caucasus, but it also belongs to Central Asia. So there are already uh, cooperation mm, on energy transportation as well. I think the both Central Asian countries and Azerbaijan have realized that, okay, there is a room for it. And the common here, I would say not enemy, but problem is how to sideline uh, ourselves from uh, Russia, kind of to avoid Russian dominance. Uh, uh, so in this regard, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan, and even Turkmenistan, they increase the interaction. But the, what I observe is that, and the problem would be, these countries do not produce anything other than oil and gas. In order to make middle corridor beneficial for the actually middle corridor people or the countries, not all Europe and China, they need to produce something other than energy resources. 
and exchange this in between each other. Because what I observe in terms of policy, they're constantly trying to uh, do something either with China or Europe kind of where, rather than they don't see the big potential in their own market, their mm -hmm. own internal market that they need also sources that can be produced maybe. So instead of investing, uh, how can we be a transit country? I think here uh, these countries should also invest. How can we benefit and exchange, create a corridor also? Uh, and then uh, I see that Azerbaijan increased its transit role. I think they, that was in the beginning, they wanted to be the source for energy, uh, but this uh, development of the ports and uh, at the same time in the other side of the Caspian Sea, Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan, also kind of coordinated. So kind of informal coordination going on between these countries. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's uh, about the biggest, I think my point would be here, the tail of the middle corridor will also depend on the uh, Ukrainian war and result of the Ukrainian war, mm -hmm. because that will either uh, scare the Central Asian and Azerbaijan or encourage them. Yeah, and an another reason, uh, Aga, for uh, Azerbaijan's development of, of a trade with Central Asia is this cargo balancing problem, because there's a lot more traffic going this way than this way. And so there's very little exports going from Azerbaijan to, to Central Asia in, in non, non uh, petroleum uh, commodities. And so that's another reason why, because again, these are independent operators of these vessels. And if they're gonna keep these vessels in these sort of middle corridor strings, they need to have a balance of imports and exports, otherwise they're not going to be profitable. So it's very important to develop export markets, both from Azerbaijan and also from Turkey that would use the middle corridor as an outlet to the consumption markets of, of Uzbekistan primarily and also Kazakhstan. Mm -hmm. Well, you we, you do hear these discussions now in Kazakhstan, like what sectors mm -hmm. can, you know, kind of for what sectors you can create these regional chains, right? Mm -hmm. uh, what you can export and, you know, maybe agricultural goods and, you know, the... Um, uh, well, the, the Kazatom Prom started exporting, although further, not to the Caucasus, but but, uh, uh, but but uranium, which is also an interesting development, right? Um, so, uh, so indeed, it, that's a, that's a extremely important point. How to make it like a working economic corridor rather than just a transport a transport corridor from which mm -hmm. actually the countries countries of the region can uh, can truly uh, truly uh, benefit um so yes um that's that's a very good point maybe ambassador ambassador master you you have thoughts on this uh, the problem that we've seen in central asia is that they all tend to produce pretty much the same thing and so what we need to see is a diversification of economies uh within the countries themselves so that they can figure out what they can export to each other. Um, the rise of the C5, uh, uh, however, is very encouraging. I, I just wanna stop on that. The, the, uh, the C5 plus one concept emerged during the Obama administration and uh, the first meeting of the C5 plus one was held in Samarkand uh, with uh, Secretary, then Secretary of State, uh, John Kerry. It was continued through then and a rather amusing incident occurred at uh, the UN General Assembly uh, that, that uh, followed uh, the, the first C5 plus one meeting when the five foreign ministers for the first time since independence sat down and had dinner together in New York City on the margins of uh, the UN General Assembly meeting. And afterwards, uh, one of the ambassador, one of the foreign ministers contacted State Department to apologize, said, we're so sorry, we forgot to invite you to dinner too. And State Department said, oh, good heavens, you don't need us. If you want to meet together as the five, please do it. Uh, have a C5 meeting, not a C5 plus one meeting. And they kind of took off after that. So uh, we were pleased as the U.S. government, at the, I was in the U.S. government at the time, that we catalyzed the C5 and got them talking to each other um that that was a huge step and and it's been very gratifying to see it continue excellent uh, i have two questions and then uh, i want to go for your recommendations like each of you to give a recommendation to whomever you want it can be the governments of the region or international uh, organizations or you know 
Western countries or, uh, well, anybody you would want to give a very com concrete recommendation to. Um, but the, the two questions I have, uh, one is related to what the war in, in Ukraine uh, and um, the relocation of companies, right? We don't know to what extent how big this relocation will end up being, but we do see we do see this uh, this trend. Um, companies are relocating to South Caucasus and to Central Central Asia. Uh, is it an opportunity for the middle corridor? Do we see it as an opportunity for the middle corridor? And uh, speaking of diversification, and uh, um, and the second question has to do with subsidies. Uh, here, I want to bring uh, well. China, China in, and you know all these discussions about the uh, Eurasian, you know, corridors, right? Uh, railway corridors. Uh, like one question was, you know, when will China stop subsidizing uh, this traffic? Um, so, uh, and you know, the, the kind of different different deadlines were given, but it seems that the subsidies are continuing. And I guess with the political situation, they might you know last uh, last longer, but. Uh, how serious is this factor in uh, in your opinion? But first, relocation and um, yeah. Um, I can I can speak to yeah. um, Kazakh relocate. So there's a lot of of course overlap in sort of the industrial profile of Kazakhstan and Russia. So the 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 over the sort of relocation of industry from Russia to Kazakhstan is a bit different than relocation of, for example, IT engineers go moving to Yerevan or something like this. And so you could see, again, that relocation of Russian capital that is in sort of freight intensive industries building up in Kazakhstan as a, as a result. And so what the net effect is going to be is still to be determined because different regions of Kazakhstan are being impacted differently because some, uh, some cities are seeing lots of IT engineers relocating, others are, are seeing uh, businesses that have both Russian and Kazakh uh, affiliates. So the Kazakh affiliates might be building up. Uh, and, and, and then you could also, that could also help some of the, some of the IT uh, could help with, again, some of the dig digitalization and, 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 and upgrading of those logistics systems as well. And some of that know-how uh, could, could help, but uh, it's going to be, it's hard to pick any one area that would, that would be dramatically impacted. Aga, did you have thoughts on this as well? Yes, I, I have the um, comment on more the subsidies uh, that uh, you already covered uh, my opinion on the relocation uh, because uh, on terms of subsidies, that's also related to my previous uh, comment that this middle corridor countries need to move uh, beyond uh, just to be trans because uh, we need to look at the middle corridor also from the external dimensions as well. For example, the sanctions, uh, the current competition between United States and China uh, that Europe can also and then the war in Ukraine as well so today these dimensions are going on and the tomorrow we don't know how it will influence because let's say that the war on Ukraine ended for the benefit of Ukraine but then new conflict started between United States and China and suddenly they started to sanction each other so how would it will uh, influence the middle corridor so in order to avoid you know the dependency uh, a single interdependency actually uh, the middle corridor needs to move beyond just uh, the railways so they need to develop also soft infrastructure soft infrastructure i would say here a coherent uh, accessibility and coherent uh, structure where can we find information about the cargo trade the customs uh, regarding this corridor under the one single maybe uh, umbrella uh, so that is a soft infrastructure they need to need. Otherwise, uh, if it gets complicated, especially for the financial, uh, not financial, but the companies, for the, even the relocation of the companies, then they will find it still not attractive because it costs a lot of uh, time and uh, energy. So in this regard, there's a, even relocation-wise of the companies from Russia or somewhere to this middle corridor countries, they need to invest in soft infrastructure because now the digital age uh, is the main thing to make uh, trade, uh, also other uh, import export uh, developments more accessible and visible. Uh, I, uh, that's what I always observe when I go to the region that you, you realize that the certain things going a bit slower uh, 
than some part of the. So I think the, here the fastest and the longest uh, strategy will win uh, the heart of the middle corridor, maybe. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have one minute, but we can make it three um, to to wrap up this uh, this uh, session. Um, Johan, I see that that you already provided recommendation. Can you can you share with the broader audience? Yeah, I think uh, I will just summarize one uh, based on my uh, work experience in development sector and nonprofit sector. So my recommendation is primarily addressed to the UN agencies. UNFCCC, uh, because right now, currently, uh, the governance of transboundary river basins, oceans, and seas uh, fall under the customary international legal principle and international conventions. However, none of the existing international laws do not explicitly discuss uh, water argumentation processes like uh, desalination and dam building. Uh, so as we are uh, facing severe impacts of climate change and water shortages is a thing, it would be very important uh, as a next step to consider creating either new language uh, that would govern everybody in regards to desalination and protection of the water rights and water bodies. Uh, so that, that is my call. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Aga, what would be your recommendation? My recommendation would be uh, to think more uh, long-term uh, strategy uh, regarding the, uh, the future prospect of the uh, region and uh, to think also beyond the traditional energy sources and move more on the renewable energy sources as well because I think Caspian Sea received a lot of pollution as uh, Jahan and Nathan also mentioned environmental consequences needs to get also priority and uh, it shouldn't be viewed today uh, a granted sea because we also saw what happened in the Central Asia uh, the lakes the water sources uh, and that's my biggest uh, suggestion to the regional countries do not sacrifice environment uh, for, for the sake of economic uh, gains, but try to do it more balanced way that it uh, improve your industrial development while not so much polluting uh, the Caspian Sea. Okay, very good. Uh, excellent. Um, Ambassador Mostyn? Well, my recommendation would be to the U.S. government and to the uh, European Commission uh, that they need to uh, counter Russian efforts to suppress the Middle Corridor uh, which to me are very clearly taking place. Um, we need to see higher level engagement from both the US government and the European Commission with the Central Asians. We need to see more engagement with uh, the Central Asians and with the South Caucasus. Uh, just get more people, um, higher level people, and engage in substantive conversations about how to make the middle corridor work. Because if they don't stand it up, if it does not grow legs, before the end of the war, things will go back to the way they were before the war and the middle corridor runs a very high risk of withering. So get the middle corridor standing up and to do that, the e EU and the US need to step up to the plate. And the fact that China is part of it shouldn't be uh, kind of minus. Well, China is going to be there. Uh, China is going to be a, a uh, a factor simply because the middle corridor in effect is going to be a corridor for transportation between Europe and China. And uh, you can't ignore China. China's not going away. We need to figure out how we're going to relate to China. Okay, thank, thank, thank you very much. Uh, Nathan, the co-organizer. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Nagis, thank you so much again. And, and so I, I would just say, you know, we've always talked about, you know, what the Caspian can do for us. We need to start thinking about what we can do for the Caspian because it's been historically abused in every way imaginable. We're finding even more ways to exploit it with desalination and, and everything else. And with respect to the framing of the middle corridor, we need to talk about the Chinese connection, but we also need to not necessarily say that if it doesn't handle a massive amount of Chinese cargo, at least in the intermediate term, it's not, it's not a success. If it, can, if it can tie these two regions together, uh, if it can integrate these regions, it should, that should be the, the marker for its success. And so we need to just basically stop uh, framing it only as a, either it's a bypass with a Northern corridor or it's a failure. 
it, it can be it can su succeed in its own right in tying these uh, these economies together because if they're not benefiting internally they're not going to in the long term invest in it it can't just be a transit route it has to benefit the countries of the region I second that. I second all the recommendations uh, provided. Well, thank thank you so much. Uh, it's been a great session, very informative. I, I learned a lot. Um, let me thank all the panelists, but especially Agak, for whom it's the end of the working, <laughs> the working day. Here we are on the, uh, in the US, kind of all fresh, <laughs> um, still fresh. And uh, let me let me thank the audience for for, for tuning in and for your uh, excellent questions. And um, last but not least, let me let me thank uh, Laura Sargent who 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 made this uh, this session possible. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks so much. Have a wonderful day. <laughs>